So aeroelasticity is a topic very close to my heart because it's in fact the background I come from. And the idea is that any time a fluid flows over or through a structure, flow-induced vibrations can occur. And under certain conditions, the structure will extract kinetic energy from the fluid, leading to larger and larger vibrations that can ultimately lead to catastrophic structural failure. As the structure moves into form, so the aerodynamic loads change. And as the loads change, so the response of the structure changes. And in this sense, a dance is performed between the aero, the elastic, and the inertial loads of the system. Aeroelastic problems can get very tedious mathematically very quickly. So in order to demonstrate a fundamental principle, I'm going to limit this to a single degree of freedom model, which is pretty simplistic, but at least it will serve to demonstrate some of the effects that come out of this sort of behavior. In this example, we have our standard mass spring damper system, only in this case, instead of drawing the mass as a block, I've drawn it as an aerodynamic shape, the idea being that the loads, the external loads that this mass is going to experience will come from aerodynamic loading. And by the way, I should mention that uh, this kind of a model could be used to model power lines, the galloping of power lines, what happens in regions where there's uh, snow. You get snow and icicles that form on a power line. As it starts to melt and refreeze, you get something that looks like like that, an aerodynamic shape, and then the wind blows and catches it. And it's a similar sort of concept. Uh, these power lines can go unstable, galloping up and down until they break, causing service outages and perhaps even brush fires. Another example might be the whistling of power lines. You ever noticed when the wind blows, every now and again you, you get a whistling sound? Do you know what that is? Do any of you know? That is the sound of the, the wind hitting the phone wires and the power wires. And what happens is it's knocking off little aerodynamic eddies like this. And under certain conditions, these are being shed. These vortices are being shed at a frequency that's in the audible range. So that's what you hear when you hear the singing or the whistling of power lines in the wind. So at this stage of the game, you should be pretty comfortable with the equation of motion for a mass spring damper system. Mx double dot plus Cx dot plus Kx is equal to some external load F of T. Call this equation one. Um, but the real question here is what is this external load? And this is going to be a little bit more foreign to those of you who are not aero guys. But this load F of T can be written as one half times rho, the density of the air, times u squared, the velocity of the free stream squared, times s, which would be the plan form area of the wing, the, the area if you look down from above. And cx is a coefficient of force in this x direction. This quantity, one half rho u squared, is also known as the dynamic pressure. We'll call this equation two. Now let's have a look at what's going on from the fluid's point of view. Right? The fluid is moving in this horizontal direction as we've drawn it with some velocity u. And if this wing is now moving up, or this airfoil is moving up with a velocity x dot, then relative to the wing, the air is moving downwards with that velocity x dot. Okay? As a result, we get a resultant u, a velocity u relative, which takes into account the fact that because of the relative motion of the wing, the angle of attack now is non-zero. We can call this angle of attack alpha, but actually angle of attack is defined positive upwards. So this would be negative alpha. Might take a few minutes just for you to wrap your minds around this, but if the wing is moving up with a velocity x dot, then the fluid relative to the wing is moving down with a velocity x dot. As a result, instead of this angle of attack being zero, the angle of attack becomes negative. In effect, it's as if the airflow is coming from there. Now, the only thing that requires a little further investigation is this little term C of Cx, which is the coefficient of force in the x direction. could be thought of like a coefficient of lift for various reasons. I don't want to call it that right here. The expression for Cx can be written as u relative squared divided by u times Cl cosine alpha plus Cd sine alpha. Now, CL is actually the lift coefficient relative. This would be CL here, and CD would be in this direction here. 
And just to be clear, we want to resolve it into an X direction. And the way we do that is like this. We take the cosine of CL and we add it to the sine of CD. Call that equation three. Now, from this drawing, we can come up with an expression for alpha or for the tangent of alpha. We can write that negative alpha is equal to the inverse tangent of x dot over u. Now, using the small angle formula, we can say that's approximately equal to x dot over u. Therefore, we can write alpha as negative x dot divided by u. We'll call that equation 4. Now, if we take equation 3 and we apply the small angle formula, if this angle is small, then u relative and u are approximately equal, and so cx can be reduced to cl cosine of alpha plus cd sine of alpha. Again, this is for small alpha, u and u relative are approximately equal, so that becomes 1. Call that equation 5. Then to figure out c of x for any arbitrary angle alpha, we can use the Taylor expansion and write c of x, which is a function of alpha, is equal to cx at alpha equals 0 plus the derivative dcx d alpha at alpha equals 0 times alpha. We'll just keep the first two terms of the Taylor expansion. We don't need beyond that. We'll call that equation 6. If we take equation 4 and 5 now and we substitute it into equation 6, we end up with cx is equal to just going to plug this in here, okay? And we're going to plug alpha in here. And we end up with Cx is Cl times cosine alpha plus Cd times sine alpha at alpha equals zero plus dCx d alpha times alpha, which is x dot over u. Sorry, negative x dot over u, I should say. That's equation seven. So turning the page, I've rewritten equation 7 here from the page before. Now, the idea is we can substitute alpha equals 0 into equation 7, and the sines and cosines can cancel. Well, the cosine becomes 1, the sine becomes 0, and we're left with Cl at alpha equals 0, minus the rest of it, dcx d alpha at alpha equals 0 times x dot over u. We'll call that equation 8. So now we can substitute equation 8 into equation 2, which I remind you is this equation here for the force. And that gives us that f of t is now equal to, and we'll call this f0, minus 1 half rho u s times dcx d alpha at alpha equals 0 times x dot. So equation 9, where f0, f0 is equal to 1 half rho u squared s times cl at alpha equals 0. And I just want to make the point that this is constant. It's just a static force. It's not particularly interesting. We know how to deal with static forces from previous problems. Let's put parentheses around it. We'll call this equation 9. Now, for all you non-error guys who are suddenly thinking, what on earth did he just throw at me? Uh, don't worry too much. Just know that everything up to now in this video has been in order to derive the forcing function in this form. So the idea is that we've got a forcing function that is some constant plus another term that is a function of our velocity x dot. That makes this very interesting. Now we can substitute equation 9 into equation 1, our original equation of motion, and we end up with mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx is equal to f0 minus 1 half rho u squared s dc d alpha at alpha equals 0 times x dot. We can rewrite this by taking this term to the other side and grouping it, grouping the x dot coefficients. This becomes mx double dot plus, and now we can group the coefficients on the x dot term as c sign changes to a positive one half rho u s dcx d alpha at alpha equals zero. All of this times x dot plus kx equals f zero. And I just want to make the point that this is now an effective damping coefficient. So what's interesting is it would appear that the damping of the system is being affected by the aerodynamic load. Call this equation 10. 
Now, you might remember from some of the previous problems that if there's damping, your amplitudes are going to die exponentially. They're going to decay. If there's no damping, if damping zero, then you would expect your oscillations to be of the same amplitude. So you might infer from this that if your damping were to become negative, then the oscillations would grow exponentially until your system failed. And that's, in fact, what happens. So to solve this system or to solve the stability requirements of this system, we can look at when does this become zero? When does it change from positive to negative? Because when that happens, the system is going to become unstable. Okay, so this implies we want to solve for C plus one half US times DCX D alpha at alpha equals zero. Solve for that equals to zero. And what we find is if we rewrite it in terms of the velocity U, this occurs at a velocity of minus two C divided by rho s dcx d alpha at alpha equals zero. Now you look at this and you say, well, <clears throat> density is positive, s is positive. This would imply a negative velocity. So we ask the question of when is dcx d alpha less than zero? Now, interestingly, for almost any aerodynamic shape you could imagine, and certainly for an airflow, any time you increase the angle of attack, the coefficient of force or the coefficient of lift would increase. So the question is, for what shapes would increasing the angle of attack actually decrease the load? And it turns out that for a square section, DCL D alpha at alpha equals zero is equal to 2.7. So if you had a section like this that was square, if that was now at an angle of attack alpha, the force would actually be downwards. Interesting. So in that case, for a square section, which might be the cross-section of a water tank, we would find the stability requirements are exceeded. So for that tank, if we have a DCL D alpha, a DCX D alpha of minus 2.7, we now find that we can have a flutter velocity. Flutter can occur on shapes like that. Now I can hear some of you saying, but what about the airfoil? Doesn't this airfoil flutter? Well, of course we know airfoils flutter, but the reality is Flutter is a combined bending torsion mode. And since this is only a single degree of freedom problem, we're looking at only bending, flutter of an airfoil does not come out of a single degree of freedom model. So a little rule of thumb, if you want to look at flutter of an airfoil, you need to include the torsion of the airfoil too. Anyway, that's about all I want to say about this problem. I want to run through it again from the start very quickly, just in case anything got lost, because more than trying to follow the math of this, I just want you to follow the concept. The idea is we've got a system here where the force on this side is a function of one of the nodal coordinates, in this case, F dot. I've shown, excuse me, X dot. The force is a function here of X dot. So as a result, as you can take those things that multiply X dot on the right over to the left side of your equation, and you can group them with the appropriate coefficients. By doing that, we were then able to use the insight that when damping goes to zero or goes negative, then you're going to get instability of your system. We found that that can occur at a velocity given by this. And the only time that velocity can be positive is for cases where the DCL or DCXD alpha is negative. And that happens in the case of, say, a square cross section. It won't happen for an airfoil or any uh, aerodynamic shapes. That brings us to the end of this video. I hope you found something useful in it. If you did, please go ahead and smash those like buttons so others can get to see it too. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear from you in the comment section below. If you'd like to be notified of new video releases, please go ahead and hit those subscribe buttons and click the bells. Thank you for watching and I will catch up with you in the next video.